Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Nathanson from St. Mary's College and um, very grateful to the organizers of Beyond IID for enabling us to record these talks so that so many of us can share our ideas. Um, this is uh, joint work that I've done with uh, Padier and, uh, and Halder uh, from a couple years ago um, on entanglement as a resource for local state discrimination in multipartite systems. Um, and so we'll start by talking about what it means, what uh, local state discrimination is all about, um, and then talk about state transformations, um, and then talk about what we mean by universal resources. So in the setup uh, is our usual LOCC setup. We have a multipartite uh, system, uh, finite dimensional, and as usual, we associate each subsystem with someone, uh, a different agent, Alice, Bob, Charlie, you name it. Um, and in this case, we, we assume that an adversary encodes a complete alphabet of size D uh, as an orthonormal basis of our Hilbert space H, and it's up to Alice and her collaborators to try to recover the identity of the matrix using only local quantum operations and classical communication. So we call this data seeking, right? Because it's it's essentially, it's the data hiding problem, but we're looking at it from the perspective of the people who are trying to, uh, to, to decode the information, okay? And so for most bases, it's not possible to perfectly recover the message H, uh, X, just using LOCC. Um, on the other hand, it may be possible for them to distinguish their bases if they share an entangled state um, that shares the same multipartite structure. So for example, if we have bi in a bipartite state, we know that we can use a maximally entangled state for quantum teleportation to distinguish any basis B. Um, and right, so um, if, you, if Alice teleports her half of the basis state to Bob, he can then measure in the orthogonal basis and, um, and determine the identity of the state. So that phi acts as a resource since it enables the information task to happen, um, but it's consumed in the process, right? So it's a, it's a precious resource. Um, now, of course, the, the adversary presumably knows which entangled resource Alice and Bob start with, um, and will change their basis accordingly. And that motivates the next definition um, uh, or the next question. So can we find an entangled state that's gonna allow our agents to distinguish the elements of any orthogonal basis of H, um, right? So that no matter what their adversary does, they'll still be able to distinguish them. And if, if so, we're gonna call that a uh, phi a universal resource. Um, so the example is what I just said, it's a bipartite maximally entangled state. It's a universal resource for state discrimination on H because it can distinguish any, any states that you can distinguish using global operations, you can distinguish using uh, local operations. Okay, so the question is, what qualities must shared in tank of Shang, excuse me, what qualities um, must shared entanglement have in order to be a universal resource. So our main result and what's going forward is an equivalence between the problem of local state discrimination and local state transformation. Um, and that's very nice because local state transformation is well studied and it's the language that we usually use to discuss uh, entanglement. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, local state transformation for a minute, a little detour. Um, so we have this fundamental question, for which states, uh, psi zero and psi one, can we use LOCC to transform a system from the state psi zero to the state psi one with positive probability? That's a, that's a good question. Um, and we use this question actually to quantify entanglement. So um, the, this is not how we're used to seeing the definition of a product state, but a product state is simply the, the state that can be reached from every other state in, in, your, in your system, right? And it doesn't matter where you start, you can use local operations and classical communication or actually no communication to, uh, to generate a product state, okay? And if it's not a product state, then we say that psi is entangled. 
And if we want to compare, we say that uh, phi is more entangled than psi, if and only if we can use LFCC to transform phi into psi with probability one, right? So we know um, that it's a very strong statement to say that one state's more entangled than another. Um, and Nielsen's theorem gives us a, a very clear condition in the bipartite case um, to show that when we can uh, transform one into the other, but it also implies very clearly that there are incomparable pairs, right? That it's this is not a complete ordering, that there is a partially ordered, um, bipartite states are partially ordered under entanglement with a unique equivalence class of maximally entangled states that forms an upper bound. Now, when we move to the multipartite picture, things get more complicated. Even in this case of three qubits, uh, we have the GHZ states and we have the W states, which are shown there, and they have different properties. Uh, GHZ maximizes the bipartite entanglement across each split. So among over all three qubit states, the GHZ maximizes the bipartite entanglement. Um, whereas over all three qubit states, the W states maximize the Schmidt rank, which is the number of terms in the minimal product uh, sum representation. So the two states are actually incomparable. Um, you can't transform W into GHZ with, with probability one. You can't uh, transform GHZ into W with probability one. So this means that the, it's partially ordered and there's actually two equivalence classes of maximally entangled state. So this set does not contain a maximum element, doesn't contain a top element as we can see in the picture um, from the article from 2000, um, uh, Dear Vidal and Sirach. Um, and so they're both maximal and partial ordering and every three qubit state can be reached from, well, every three qubit state with genuine tripartite entanglement can be reached from exactly one of them and every three qubit state can be reached uh, from at least one of them. So now let's think about how that relates to our question about entanglement as a resource. In general, we know that locally distinguishing large sets of quantum states is hard, and there's a fundamental theorem um, um, by uh, HSSH from uh, 03, um, and uh, Hordecki, Sensen, and Hordecki, um, that um, if you have a complete orthonormal basis of H, then if the elements of B can be perfectly distinguished with LFCC, then they must each be product states. Okay, if any of the uh, states in the bases are entangled, then there is no possibility of um, distinguishing a complete orthonormal basis. Um, note that this condition is necessary but not sufficient because we know this right from the uh, non-locality without entanglement bases, um, which are bases of product states that cannot be distinguished with LOCC, at least not perfectly. Okay, um, so we say, all right, this is hard. Let's let's loosen up the requirements a little bit. Instead of asking for perfect discrimination, we're going to ask for unambiguous discrimination. And what this means is that um, we have a set of inputs that can be unambiguously distinguished if for each possible input x, there's a positive probability of correctly identifying it when it's sent, and there is zero probability of identifying it when it's not sent. So that's really good. Um, the cost of this is that there's a possibility that the protocol will just fail and will just give you a completely non-informative result. Um, and so using, um, I mean, the concept of unambiguous discrimination is from classical information theory, but in, in quantum, we know that using full quantum operations, a set of quantum states can be unambiguously distinguished if and only if they are linearly independent. Okay, so very, very nice, simple condition. And even unambiguous discrimination is hard when we're restricted to LOCC. Um, and so a nice uh, theorem by Duan and collaborators, um, if, for, if we have a complete basis, now not necessarily orthogonal, for each of the uh, basis elements, we can let uh, psi i be the vector that is orthogonal to all the other psi j, 
Okay, this is uniquely defined um, because you have a complete basis. And um, these, these states form what's called the reciprocal basis. And the elements of B can be unambiguously distinguished with LOCC if and only if all the elements in the reciprocal basis uh, are product states. So it's very similar to the previous result. And in fact, if the basis is orth orthogonal, then psi i and psi i tilde are actually the same. And so this reduces to the previous result. Um, so, and that's actually an if and only if, which mean, which shows us that the, um, go back to here, that the uh, non-locality without entanglement basis can be distinguished unambiguously, um, just not perfectly. So here's our formal definition of a universal resource, which we sort of hinted at. Um, a state psi in H prime is universal for state discrimination if for every basis of H, the states uh, psi tensor uh, B can be perfectly distinguished with LOCC, and it's universal for local unambiguous discrimination if for every set of linearly independent states, every basis, um, the set of uh, sets states psi tensor B can be unambiguously distinguished with LOCC, right? So these are formal definitions of what we said. And the question is, which states can function as universal resources? So if you allow phi to live in a large space, then you can find uh, universal resource states. And in fact, there's a very obvious example. If we let H be a, a system of three qubits, um, we can construct a uh, state, which is simply the a bell state between uh, Alice and Charlie and a bell state between Bob and Charlie. And this lives in Alice and Bob can still have qubit states, but now Charlie needs a four-dimensional space to work in. And but because he because Charlie shares a maximally entangled state with both Alice and Bob, they can teleport their pieces of their states to him, and then he can do a complete measurement. So this state is a universal resource for quantum um, perfect discrimination for three qubits. But notice it's not a three qubit state, right? You have to get you have to get bigger. Okay, and the question is, do we always have to look to a larger space for our resources? Um, and then the theorem that gives us an answer to this uh, comes from our paper. It says that if we have a basis that can be perfectly distinguished with LSCC uh, in the presence of an entangled state phi then there exists a protocol that transforms phi star into each of the, the psi i into probability one over, with probability one over d. So with equal probability adding up to one. Um, so this gives us a necessary condition for perfect state discrimination with LOCC in, um, enabled or enhanced by the presence of a resource phi. Um, and in this problem, phi star is simply the entry-wise complex conjugate of phi in the standard basis. Okay, so among other things, uh, this gives a necessary condition that for any entanglement monotone E, we have to have the E of phi star at least as big as the average of the E of E of the psi i's. Okay. Um, and that's because of the definition of an entanglement monotone. So when it comes to unambiguous discrimination, the previous theorem can become a biconditional. So let's, for any orthonormal basis or orthogonal basis, uh, nope, that should not say that. For any basis, doesn't even need to be or orthonormal, uh, of H, um, we again look at, at phi and phi star being its entry-wise complex conjugate. Um, then the set of states can be unambiguously distinguished if and only if there is an LLCC protocol which transforms uh, psi star into each of the psi i tilde with positive probability. So you can transform phi star 
into each um, of the elements of the reciprocal basis with positive probability. And um, that's a now an if and only if, which is very, very nice. So if we apply this to universal states, we can see that if we have a universal resource, it must be possible to transform it, to transform phi into psi um, for any psi in H. And why is that? Because pick a, pick a psi in H, apply d minus one local unitaries to it, such that your answer, your result is linearly independent. Now you have a basis um, of states that all look like psi locally. Um, and the, we can then transform those uh, all into psi. And that implies that we must be able to, to, um, to map phi or phi star really um, to, to psi with probability one. Okay, and so we have such a resource for bipartite states. Um, when the question is, can we find a similar resource for tripartite cutit state? Is there a state in H itself that allow, enables unambiguous discrimination of any basis of H? Um, and the answer is no. So what we showed is there does not exhibit, uh, exist a universal resource state um, for either local state discrimination or local unambiguous discrimination. And in fact, there exhibit exist bases of B such that for every phi in H, phi tensor B cannot be locally distinguished. Okay, so this is even if, even if you remove the assumption of universality, okay, and the negative result follows directly from that cor corollary. Um, if there are multiple maximally entangled classes, as there are for three qubits, then there's no hope of, of this corollary being satisfied for any phi in H itself. Okay, so we'll look at a couple of other examples of candidates for universal uh, universal resources, in particular from for, for three qubits. Um, so here's a state, um, which is a generalized GHG state, but now it's in a three qutrit state. Um, and you can show that you can locally transform this into both a W state and a three qubit GHG state, which means you can then tra transform it into any three qubit state. Um, so it is universal for unambiguous state discrimination um, on three qubits. So this three qutrit state is universal for three qubits. Um, one more three qubit example um, where it's, you can see it lives in a cutrit state paired with two qubit states. Um, and what's interesting about this one is that it is universal for the problem of unambiguous discrimination uh, on three qubits, but it is not universal for perfect state discrimination. Because so those, those, um, those are distinct questions. Okay, and the E, I'll just sort of show you how one thinks about these things. Um, to show that it's universal for unambiguous discrimination, all you need to do is show that you can write, uh, you can find product matrices that are uh, product operations that take you from psi three to W and from psi three to GHZ. Um, and um, so if, if such local operations exist, then you know that it's universal for unambiguous discrimination. Um, if you can transform it into every single one of the maximally entangled classes, then you're fine. And for the case of three qubits, um, there are only two. Um, as, the, as the number of qubits gets larger, the number of maximally entangled classes becomes uncountable, so that becomes a little more complicated, but um, that's where we are. Um, the proof part two showing that it's not universal for perfect discrimination, all we have to do is um, find a basis that it's not going to work for. And um, in particular, we can show that the um, if we have a basis with two GHG states and six W states, and we look at the entanglement across the AB and split it with C, then the average entanglement will have to increase um, if we can transform phi into, into this basis with uh, each with probability one eighth. 
Um, so that means that they're not perfectly distinguishable, right? So these are sorts of the ways that you think about proving these, proving statements like this. Um, so I just put put in the various different resource states that we've looked at. Um, these are the these are the three states we've talked about so far, and you can see how how they're related in terms of transformation. Um, one final example, um, which is just very general, is we can talk about the, a generalized GHG state in dimension R with n parties. Okay, so uh, this is an n-partite state, um, and each system is dimension R, and it's a universal resource if and only if R is bigger than the to the Schmidt measure, which is simply the number, the maximum number of terms needed for a product representation of a state um, in our system H. Um, and so that's nice, right? It gives us a nice universal resource for unambiguous discrimination, um, which is why the GHC 3.3 works for, uh, for three qubits. Um, and so open questions. Um, I've, I've resisted the urge to talk about um, resources that are that are basis specific, um, but we can also ask a lot of these questions in terms of basis specific uh, resources um, and use the use our results for those. But open questions relating to universal resources. Um, so we just said that this that GHCRN is a universal resource for R sufficiently large. Um, what's the minimum value of R that will work for a given H? And this problem, the problem of calculating the Schmidt rank for an arbitrary multipartite state uh, is MP hard. So this question is likely hard as well. Um, we do have a lower bound in the case of um, uh, where the dimension is a uh, power of two, um, and there and all the states have the all the systems have the same dimension. Uh, in this case, we, sh we, we this lower bound was given in in two thousand ten. Um, so it's big. Uh, and and the last question I just want to go go with right. We have this nice general uh, expression for generalized GHG state. Is it universal for local state discrimination and not just for unambiguous discrimination? Um, that is, if we make R sufficiently large, can you make it universal for local state discrimination? Um, and we have the necessary conditions, but we know that that condition is not, um, not sufficient, just necessary. So this is actually, this is not a trivial question, um, or at least does not appear to be trivial to me. Okay, um, so these are, the, these are our two papers that uh, came out in, in FizRev A and uh, two other papers that we cited here. Um, there's a lot of rich uh, material around this, and um, I encourage you to uh, find out more. Um, and feel free to contact me if you have questions. Okay, thank you very much.